Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And GameStop just won't stop being the story of the week and what might become the story of the year, depending on how much Wall Street bets and Reddit continues to upend some of the common principles and understandings that so many people have about the operation of the stock market. Now, before we get into the substance of today's video, I want to tell you, we're going to talk about three major topics. We're going to talk about this lawsuit because a lot of you asked me to talk about it, and so we're going to cover that. I think in general, it's a fairly weak suit. Doesn't mean a stronger suit couldn't come out of the weeds sometime later, but this suit that was filed, as one might expect, within hours of Robin Hood acting yesterday isn't really much to hang your hat on. The second thing we're going to be talking about is this notion that people were getting closed out of their positions on the day and at a price in GameStop stock and perhaps other stocks that they would not have chosen to close their position at, and what exactly Robinhood was doing there, why it might make sense, why it might not make sense, why it might have been something to protect themselves from liability, either for regulatory compliance or their own financial exposure or for something more nefarious, of course, as I know a number of you have brought up in my comments. And as part of that, the third portion of this video is going to be talking about the potential uh, for financial misfeasance and most importantly, the optics around the ownership structure that really lends itself to these kinds of conspiracy theories that might well bear fruit at some point in the future, but that we simply cannot know as of today. Now, I'm telling you about those three parts. I will put chapters in this video, but for some reason, the YouTube chapter system has not been working on these videos so terribly well. So I wanted to inform you of that in case there's one part or another that you'd like to see first or never, uh, that you can look at the chapters in the description of this video and click to go where you want to go. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at Brendan Nelson versus the Robin Hood Financial Group. This was a class action lawsuit uh, filed, I believe, in New York yesterday, really on the day, within hours of Robin Hood electing to halt buying of stocks uh, that were extremely volatile, the ones that we have been talking about earlier in this series, while still allowing people to close their position, selling their stocks, which of course offended a whole lot of people. A lot of people are angry about that business proposition. I don't blame them from that perspective. If you don't feel like the application has done you right, I cannot blame you at all. The question as ever is, is it illegal? And certainly if it is, I don't feel that this lawsuit is the one to make that case terribly strongly. So let's take a look at it. Robinhood is an online brokerage firm. We can agree with that. Robinhood purposefully, willfully, and knowingly removing the stock GME, that's GameStop, from its trading platform. That's in blue. We can agree to that. It definitely willfully and knowingly removed buying of the GameStop stock on its platform in the midst of an unprecedented stock rise. Okay deprived retail investors of the ability to invest in the open market and manipulating the open market. Now, we've talked about a lot of lawsuits here in virtual legality. I suspect if this isn't your first rodeo here, then you can recognize that the language in this is too broad, right? Much like whether or not Epic has the right to a place on the Apple App Store. One thing that you have to kind of take apart from these lawsuits and these complaints about Robinhood is, do you have a right as a customer, as just somebody that wants to invest in GameStop stock, to invest in GameStop stock through the Robinhood application? And I would say, in general, no. You don't have a right to use anybody's specific application, anybody's specific platform or software. Obviously, when you enter into a contract, you're going to have certain rights and obligations that affix to one another, and we'll talk about those, of course. But when Robinhood says, we are not going to allow purchases of GameStop stock any longer, you always had the right to go to a different market participant. And yes, a lot of those closed down the trading as well. We're going to talk about that as part of this video, but some others didn't. And if you were really inclined to buy this stock, you could go do that. One of the problems with that for somebody trying to bring a contract claim, bring a lawsuit like this one, is that they have to show damages. And yeah, they might have been invested in Robinhood and maybe it's a little bit difficult to go and immediately open up an account at another location. And we'll talk about the transparency and communication is perhaps the strongest element of this lawsuit, but they always had an option. Robinhood is not the market. And I think a lot of people are kind of misunderstanding that, misreading it, maybe deliberately, maybe just accidentally. It's certainly the case that a number of people have gotten invested in the stock market, both literally and figuratively, this week, seemingly for the first time. I don't blame anybody for not necessarily recognizing how these things work, but Robinhood is just a portal to what amounts to a stock exchange, which is a bunch of people buying and selling, and it facilitates it for you. 
but them not allowing you to buy GameStop stock is not closing off every retail investor's ability to purchase that stock. It's just through their application. Then we get a recitation of the parties. We learn that Robinhood Financial is the registered broker dealer. It has a clearing arrangement with Robinhood Securities. And again, I know enough to be dangerous here. I'm a lawyer. I am not a investor dealer. I'm not a broker. I'm not a clearing house. I'm not a market maker. Um, so for the specifics, for the actual down in the weeds, FINRA regulations and things along those lines, you might want to find financial or broker dealer YouTube rather than specifically corporate lawyer YouTube. But I think we can still talk about these things. And certainly a clearinghouse is just something that's helping make the market work, is helping actually affect these trades for the underlying application that is actually brokering them. And so this is a family of entities. Uh, Robin Hood Markets here at the end, I believe, owns both of these entities. They're all being sued here because this person believes that they did him wrong. They have a jurisdiction and venue complaint. And then we get into factual allegations. Robin Hood is an online brokerage firm. Its customers place securities trades through the firm's website by using a web-based application. Robin Hood permits customers to purchase and sell securities, including futures contracts. We're good so far. On or about March 23rd, 2016, Robin Hood's official Twitter account stated, let the people trade. They have since disregarded their mantra and have blocked access for millions of its customers to trade particular securities. Uh-oh. See, we're already only in paragraph 13 of this complaint in allegedly factual allegations, the building blocks of the case you're going to make. And you are using a Twitter statement that says, let the people trade, which is clearly a branding device and then saying they disregarded their mantra. Now, you could potentially fashion that into some kind of fraud claim. Say, this is why I invested in Robin Hood, and it was because they claimed to be this, and they're not. That doesn't actually happen here, and it's a very weak claim, even if they tried it. But you can see already that we're getting into this kind of more notional, marketing-based lawsuit making rather than strictly legal documentation. At that time, January 11th, Robin Hood allowed retail investors to trade GameStop on the open market. On or about January 27th, Robinhood, in order to slow the growth of GameStop. Now, that's that's just a raw allegation, right? You are now saying to the court that Robinhood had no other motive, no business reason, but did this thing yesterday morning or two mornings ago in order to slow the growth of GameStop and deprive their customers of the ability to use their service abruptly, purposefully, willfully, willfully and knowingly pulled GameStop from their app, meaning retail investors could no longer buy or even search for GameStop on Robinhood's app. Now, this is a better description of what's actually happening here, right? It's not every investor that was affected by this. Uh, and certainly, they limited, they restricted trades in GameStop. I'm not sure if they pulled it from their app as a terribly good locution here in a lawsuit, but we'll see that in a couple of places where you get kind of a more forum-based approach of describing these things rather than the strict legalese that would ordinarily be called for in this document. But you have now, in paragraph 16, asserted to the court that they had ulterior motives, they were bad, uh, and you're going to need to back that up. Upon information and belief, Robin Hood's actions were done purposefully and knowingly to manipulate the market for the benefit of people and financial intuitions, probably institutions intended there, who were not Robin Hood's customers, meaning the Citadel group we'll talk about in a second, and perhaps their other ancillary Robin Hood arms. And so this, again, is alleging really bad acts with nothing, right? This isn't based on anything. This is based solely on this ownership relationship and whispers. Additionally, in the event GameStop goes down, Robinhood has deprived investors of shorting GameStop in the hopes the price drops, which is an odd thing to add. And they have deprived investors of potential gains if GameStop prices have gone up because you can't buy GameStop on their platform. Indeed, they potentially have, but the market's still there. GameStop's still trading. You don't have the right to use Robinhood. You could have gone somewhere else. And now you have trouble, even if you make the rest of your case, in showing the court that you were damaged. You actually have to establish that you would have bought this thing through Robinhood. You would have made all this money, which, of course, would have affected the market in and of itself if enough people did that. And you chose not to find another brokerage firm, even though this one was doing you wrong, not doing what you wanted it to do because reasons. That's going to be something you have to answer in a lawsuit like this. In sum, Robinhood has completely blocked retail investors from purchasing GameStop for no legitimate reason. Again, only the ones that want to use their services, thereby depriving retail investors from the benefits of Robinhood's services. Okay. All right. 
but you could have used other investment applications. Then you have a paragraph that looks good and turns out that it's not so good. The Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, which governs brokers like Robinhood, espouses Rule 5310 regarding best execution and interpositioning. Rule 5310.01, regulations, gotta love them, requires that Robinhood must make every effort to execute a marketable customer order that it receives promptly and fully. By failing to respond at all to customers placing timely trades and outright blocking customers from trading a security, Robinhood has breached these among other obligations and caused its customers substantial losses due solely to its own negligence and failure to maintain adequate infrastructure. Now, you've got a couple of legal things happening here. We're going to talk about FINRA in just a second, but you don't ordinarily see somebody claim that somebody did something willfully, knowingly, maliciously, wrongly, and then say in legal terms that that is negligence. Negligence is accident. I didn't take enough care. I didn't worry about this thing enough. And so something bad happened to you. I deliberately did this thing for my own nefarious ends. Doesn't actually jive very well with a negligence claim. And so you get that already kind of bubbling up to the surface. The next thing though, is that this FINRA rule, right? You have to make every effort to execute a marketable customer order that you receive fully and promptly. Sounds good, but we also know it can't possibly be the end of the story, right? You don't get the right to just say, hey, Vanguard, hey, Wells, hey, Robin Hood, whomever, I want you to buy this for me or sell this for me. You have to go through their application process. They have to accept you. Robin Hood's probably easier than most, but every member that is FINRA compliant doesn't have to honor every random person off the street in whatever their trades are that they want to make. We know this intuitively, but this rule is written pretty broadly. Regulations, I don't need to inform you if you've been in virtual legality for a while, aren't always written in the most succinct and most effective manner. And so what this probably should say is that a member must make every effort to execute a marketable customer order that it receives and accepts fully and promptly. And if we go and we look at other sources, you don't have to take my word for it. We can go into places like the Bloomberg Law article on this that says the following. Brokerages are permitted broad discretion in limiting trades to provide flexibility in handling unusual situations like technical glitches, mechanical errors, and mistakes, or to preserve an orderly market, said Columbia Law School professor Joshua Mitz, who specializes in corporate law. There is no obligation that a broker dealer has to unconditionally accept orders to buy, sell, or short sell securities, said Cam Funkhauser, a former executive at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, a Wall Street-backed regulator that oversees broker-dealers, FINRA, if they do accept orders, it is expected that the transaction is executed and settled in compliance with the applicable rules, said Funkhauser, who worked at FINRA for 35 years and oversaw its National Fraud Detection Office. This is a pretty good source that Bloomberg Law has found here, and it's exactly what we would expect from the corporate law side of things. Once you have agreed that you're going to do this thing for somebody, then yes, you have fiduciary obligations, obligations that are imposed in this case by regulation to do it to the best of your ability, to find a good market for them, to market these purchases or sales to the best that you can. If you decide not to accept purchases of GameStop stock, this doesn't kick in and mandate that you do so and put your financial situation at Robinhood in jeopardy. So that particular provision, which appeared on its face to be the strongest that we would see in the lawsuit, doesn't really make sense much of a difference. Finishing off with this section from Bloomberg Law, it is understandable that many investors are upset by the sudden restrictions to trade certain stocks, especially if they didn't read the user agreements very carefully, said Tom Lin, a law professor at Temple University's Beasley School of Law, whose specialities include securities regulation. Whether brokerages should exercise that power in the current circumstances is up for legitimate debate. Indeed, it is. This and the, re- the previous videos in this series are not a defense of what Robin Hood did, and it's not telling you that you have to like it. It's talking about the legal strength of a challenge to what they elected to do. Now, this professor also says there is likely so much more to this story than we know at the moment, which I can only say spoilers. We're going to talk about that in the third section of this video. So we've got rid of the kind of FINRA argument. We've got rid of some of the rest of the color that have been added here. Robinhood continues to randomly 
pull other securities from its app for no legitimate reason. Again, strong, not terribly legally oriented. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to point to the stocks that Robinhood pulled as those that were experiencing extreme volatility over a very short window of time, three to five days. Upon information and belief, Robinhood is pulling securities like GameStop from its platform in order to slow growth and help benefit individuals and institutions who are not Robinhood customers. Again, just raw assertions. You're going to have to bring a little bit more to the party to survive summary dismissal on something like this. Plaintiff's experience. The stock did not even appear on January 28th, 2021, although GameStop is a publicly traded company available on all other platforms. It's kind of self-defeating for your damage claim right there. Also, it's not true. Other platforms were limiting trading at the same time. Then we get a nice recitation of why this could be a class Akaton. Again, probably action, I think we can assume there. Uh, But this is basically fill in the blanks. Hey, we've got a lot of people. They have common interests. Class action is the best way to go about things. As we've done prior in virtual legality, this is to comply with the federal rules uh, on how a class action should be formed. But it is very boilerplate, very pulled off the shelf rapidly, clearly not typo corrected for things like Akaton. And then you get to his actual claims, right? Cause of action number one breach of contract. And now this is one we've talked about, right? We've got a problem actually asserting a breach. Robin Hood breached its customer agreement by, among other things, failing to disclose that its platform was going to randomly pull a profitable stock, that Robin, that Robin Hood failed to provide adequate explanation to their customers, that Robin Hood knowingly put their customers at a disadvantage compared to customers who used other trading apps. Now that sounds like a good reason to get off Robin Hood, but it doesn't necessarily make what they did illegal that Robinhood failed to provide access to its own financial incentives to pull certain securities, including GameStop, that Robinhood's prohibited plaintiffs from performing in a timely manner or at all under the contract, that Robinhood failed to comply with all applicable legal, regulatory, and licensing requirements, and that Robinhood failed to exercise trades and actions requested by customers. As we talked about yesterday, the real problem for all of this is going to be in the contract itself. Restrictions on trading. I understand that Robin Hood may, in its discretion, prohibit or restrict the trading of securities or the substitution of securities in any of my accounts. I agreed on the dotted line that Robin Hood could take these actions. And we're going to talk about why Robin Hood might need to take these actions in the second part of this video. But you agreed to this when you opened a Robin Hood account. And that is the default rule for kicking your case out of court, right? It doesn't mean you can't win it. You can claim these things are unconscionable or void for public policy or all these various other things that people bring up in my comments. You can bring those things. It is a much taller hill when in black and white on the page, it says, I understand when I give money to Robinhood, Robinhood can restrict or prohibit my trading of securities at its discretion. And you say, no judge, I didn't mean that. Here's why you should kick that out of court. That is a tougher claim than they don't have the right to do that at all, which on the page, they 100% do. That's not addressed at all in this. It's not even kind of disarmed like a bomb. Uh, And we saw how that was a problem in the Parler versus Amazon Web Services case last week, I believe it only was. And so you don't properly address that there isn't a breach that you can bring here. And so you get into trouble. Cause of action two, based on that kind of breach concept, breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Robinhood was obligated to provide the trading services required under those contracts at all times. We know that isn't true. We know that Robinhood has a whole series of things that it can do to prevent trading if it deems it necessary, not just for itself, not just potentially to benefit its fiduciary partners, but because it has to to comply with SEC capital regulations and things along those lines, which may or may not come into play here. Robin Hood unfairly interfered with the rights of plaintiffs and members of the class and subclass to receive the benefits of the customer agreement by, among other things, failing to provide services necessary to carry out a trade, failing to provide certain trading services whatsoever, failing to inform individuals in a timely manner of the drastic changes in trading abilities, and prohibiting plaintiffs from buying GameStop for Robin Hood's own pecuniary interest and not disclosing those interests to plaintiffs and all class and subclass members. Now, You keep getting this recitation. We broadly know what they're talking about. This is the Citadel stuff we're going to talk about later on in the video, but you don't tell the court that. So you're just asserting these kinds of things. And yes, three and four here are stronger than a flat breach claim. If you want to bring to the court that they breached their duty of good faith and fair dealing, what you have to do is say, yes, they had the right in the contract to restrict trading, 
but they don't have the right to do that unfairly, unreasonably, to only their benefit and not the benefit of those that they have a fiduciary responsibility for. So you get close to it with things like, we didn't tell you we were going to do this until the market opened. You're close there to saying at least something that the court would have to consider rather than the breach claim and everything else. But you don't frame it properly, which is one of the reasons this lawsuit is weak. And you might well see a class action done by a more formal law firm that provides the context for these kinds of things better and stronger in the near future. But this lawsuit in front of me that so many of you asked me to read is just not strong. And when you get to four, which is essentially, hey, they might have done some bad stuff with some of the people that had a financial interest in them, but I'm not going to tell you what or how or what they should have told us when I apparently knew it and I knew that it existed and now can bring it to the court. We've got a problem because it sounds like you had public information about it, only you are now claiming that you didn't and you won't tell us what you're even talking about from a lawsuit perspective. Cause of action three, negligence, we already talked about a little bit, but it's worth noting that when you say somebody's doing willful and knowing and malicious things, it's hard to bring a negligence claim. Robinhood had a duty to exercise reasonable care in providing trades on the free open market for its customers. No, it didn't. (laughs) It didn't. Once it accepts your trade, it has a duty of some kind as a fiduciary and under FINRA and other rules and regulations to use its best efforts, to use its professional capabilities to affect those trades. Robinhood doesn't have a duty to provide trades to anybody. It can reject anyone. It can kick anyone off its service. Uh, And we're going to talk about more along those lines, closing positions in just a minute. Robinhood unlawfully breached its duties by, among other things, removing GameStop, failing to provide financial services, and failing to notify customers. None of those are negligent. You've already claimed that those are willful acts. In fact, number one and number two you have is deliberately willful earlier in this document. So you've created this kind of legal morass and maze that doesn't really help out your claim at the end of the day. Their actions breach any duty of care to their customers, but are also inconsistent with the standard of care expected from similar firms in the open market. Upon information and belief, no institutions similar to Robinhood has ever outright banned customers from purchasing a specific share of a specific security. You're going to lose on that alone because as of yesterday, a whole number of generally internet facing brokerages did exactly this. On the verge, E-Trade confirms it halted GameStop and AMC stock will let you buy some on Friday. Amid the extraordinary volumes in GameStop and AMC, we chose to limit client activity in these names late in the trading day. Why? In order to ensure that we could continue to serve our broader client base. We take actions like this seriously and only initiate them in rare circumstances. We expect to resume normal trading options tomorrow. That's just E-Trade. And you have a number of examples of people taking the same steps. We're going to talk about why in the next section of this video. And we're going to talk about why, yes, you can absolutely believe it is for pecuniary interests that aren't their customers and all this various stuff that maybe deserves an investigation. In fact, I I would argue that it probably does deserve an investigation for reasons we'll talk about as part of this video. But there are reasons that it wouldn't have to be a conspiracy, that it wouldn't have to be financial fraud. And we should never discount all options when we're evaluating these things uh, from this perspective in virtual legality. Cause of action number four, breach of fiduciary duty. Robinhood breached its fiduciary duties to plaintiff and class members by, among other things, failing to disclose that its platform was going to remove GameStop purchases in a timely manner, removing it, and removing it for its own pecuniary benefits. Again, hinting at that shadow conspiracy of advantaging the hedge funds and other financial market makers that are involved or closely connected with the Robinhood group. But you didn't make the case strong enough. Request relief. Enter an immediate injunction requiring Robinhood to reinstate GameStop on their trading platform. You'll see as we talk about the next section that Robinhood has already done that in part. Enter an award for plaintiffs to be determined. Again, you're going to have a hard time proving damages with this set of facts. Enter an award for attorney's fees. Of course, you got to ask for the attorney's fees. And enter an award for punitive damages for the willful, wanton, and reckless behavior of defendants. Let's get me some cheddar. We need to punish these people. That's why I filed this thing first. And yes, lawyers, I know, I can't impugn my colleagues and their good names, but this is not a winner lawsuit. I don't want to tell you how to believe these things. I think there could be a stronger lawsuit in the future on similar facts to this one, uh, but this isn't the one, I don't think. 
Now, I also want to give a warning, right? I don't give legal advice here, and you shouldn't take this as individual legal advice exactly. But I also saw a number of uh, essentially post your information, post your positions. I think I even saw somebody asking for uh, an TIN, uh, an employment identification number or social security number to fill in to quote unquote, join a class action against Robin Hood. This isn't legal advice. Just watch yourselves out there. Watch your personal information. If you are involved in this, if you're worried about these kinds of things, don't generally enter in your information into a random form page that says we're collecting it for a class action. Go figure out who's making these things. Figure out exactly where your information is going. I do worry that some people are going to get burned pretty badly on some of the stuff that we are seeing happen this week. So that's the lawsuit. I think it's weak. I do think it could be stronger. And we're going to talk about how you might see a class action or even another positioned action on some stronger terms. First, we're going to talk about Robinhood on an update on market volatility. This past year, we've seen the financial markets become a voice for the voiceless. We've seen a new generation of people come into the market, sparking conversations about what it means to be an investor. You're already, you're already in good hands, right? Okay, we've, we've entered the world of marketing blog posts. Our customers have shown the world that investing is for everyone, not just institutional investors and hedge funds. Okay, Robin Hood. Amid this week's extraordinary circumstances in the market, we made a tough decision today to temporarily limit buying for certain securities. As a brokerage firm, we have many financial requirements, including SEC net capital obligations and clearing house deposits. Now, as I said earlier in the video, these are ridiculously, enormously complex sets of regulations that really specialists in the world of securities investment, in public markets, in broker-dealer type things, in investor-related FINRA and SEC compliance are focused on. And if there's a YouTuber out there talking specifically about things like net capital obligations in a volatile market with liquid securities against option calls and uh, floats and all those good things, go find them. Tell me where they are. I'll watch their videos myself. But what's sufficient to know here is that Robinhood has gone out and they've also said, hey, starting tomorrow, that's today, Friday, we plan to allow limited buys of these securities, that what happened yesterday, according to them, you don't have to believe them, this is their statement, is that we got into a situation at Robinhood where we had too much exposure and the SEC requires certain things about our asset base. That's your net capital obligations and clearing house deposits. We have to have a certain amount of solvency, ability to get liquid, to cover the positions that we have and we've facilitated for our investor group. And what really becomes a problem for the Robin Hoods of the world, for the smaller internet retail focused brokerages of the world, is if one or more of the stocks that they're using as collateral, specifically for their accounts on margin, which we'll also talk about as part of this video, get really volatile, start going wildly up and down. It makes an extreme exposure position for these companies. And Either the regulatory requirements kick in and say, you need to lock things down because you can't do all this. You don't have enough asset base that is covering your positions or their own financial exposure risk. And and one of the things I think is uh, important to remember here is people talk, ah, to the heck with the free market, huh? Robinhood is a free market entity. Robinhood is an entity that is allowed to make determinations as a business. It is not a suicide pact, as you sometimes hear referred to in respect of constitutional arguments. They don't have to go down with the ship. They can try to control their risk exposure. And in fact, the SEC and FINRA expect them to control their risk exposure because some significantly bad things happen when you're invested with a brokerage and the brokerage itself goes under. So we have this enormous set of regulations, including capital obligations that are designed to prevent brokerages from getting into a position where you've invested in them and they went under because they were overexposed and too many things were bought on margin and they owed too many people too much money and investors fled to the wind and never paid them and all these very bad things. And so Robinhood is telling you a story that you can believe or not believe that says, here is what happened. Now I will tell you from my perspective, this is just my position. I'm inclined to believe these kinds of statements because that enormous volatility is a novel action that we're not used to seeing and that I do believe as we talk about this that Robinhood's baseline ability, that when you sign up for Robinhood, it appears that you actually buy the shares on margin. And we're going to talk about why it looks like that. And if you're involved in Robinhood, if you signed up this week, you want to leave a comment to this video and explain exactly what that looked like. We're going to talk about some of that in this video, but it does appear that whether or not you knew it, 
Robin Hood was fronting the money for your purchases before your deposits would have cleared the bank. And that creates exposure risk. Now, I do want to give a hat tip to Joe Morrison Jr. at JRM Jr. 1. He is a colleague of mine. Full disclosure, I've worked with him for more than a decade. He flagged this series of tweets for me uh, from Dia, uh, Diogenes at Wall Street Cynic. And he says, best take I've seen. Uh, this is a long thread. I will link this in the description to the video. But suffice it to say, it comes to a similar conclusion to what we have seen so far. As the story circulated, what was happening with GameStop, GameStop stock went parabolic, went to the moon, as you might be more familiar with it. And other stocks with high short interest also went up in sympathy. But so many retail investors began to buy these stocks on margin that the online brokers began having regulatory clearinghouse capital issues today. These brokerages, but not others, began to restrict trading in the volatile stocks per their customer agreements. As we just talked about, they have the right to restrict trading, especially if their risk profile is getting too high, so as to not violate their regulatory capital limits and all hell broke loose. Retail traders were outraged that they were not allowed to buy more of a stock that was up 20 times over the past three months, that somehow the Wall Street elites were preventing them from profiting even more so as to protect hedge funds, many of whom were long, which is an important note here. There are hedge funds on the buy side, of course, and short seller. As a result, politicians joined the fray, decrying the regulatory system that they would normally defend so as to curry favor with the aggrieved investor class that had already made a killing in a very smart trade. Now, you can tell this guy to go wherever you like and you don't have to agree with him, but I will tell you that it matches up with my understanding of the situation and certainly the understandings that I have seen from other people that are even more well-versed in this kind of stuff than I am, which suffice it to say means, bare minimum, there is a universe out there in which what Robinhood did, what E-Trade did, what some of the other folks did in terms of trying to limit volatility to limit their own exposure was in their own business interest, which is completely legitimate under the law and in the marketplace in general, and doesn't require a grander conspiracy of helping out Wall Street elites and hedge funds and their own pecuniary interest, as we saw in the lawsuit. You can disregard that entirely and say, well, that's not what happened, Rick. It went this direction. But I think it's important to know before we continue on with this video that it's a possibility that they were complying with securities laws, regulatory compliance reasons, limiting their own risk exposure. Everybody came to a similar decision because of the rapid up and down swings of the GameStop stock. Then you say, but Rick, more happened yesterday, didn't it? And I say, indeed, it did. Hat tip to Sonny at 555 Sunny here who is one of the places, this is all over the internet, that pointed out that Robinhood was in fact liquidating positions yesterday, certainly at least allegedly by what we've seen on Twitter and elsewhere. Important information about your Robinhood account. In light of recent volatility, we are restricting transactions for certain securities to position closing only. However, due to the unreasonable risk involved in brokering your position, we have closed your 4,500 shares of GameStop for an average price of 118.93, which nobody wants because it's, I think it's even higher than that right now, on January 28th, 2021 at 11.24 a.m. Your trade confirmation will be available in your order history. So they locked out people. They didn't just say you can't buy, you can only sell. They said, we're going to sell for you to at least a certain subset of people. Now, this was brought to my attention by a number of folks. Thank you, as always, uh, yesterday morning and into the afternoon. And my initial thought was, okay, that's margin calls, right? As they said in their earlier statement, we also raised margin requirements for certain securities. And buying on margin, we'll talk about in just a second, but they probably raised them to 100%. We are not going to float you money to buy GameStop stock. We are instead going to require that you have all the money deposited in our accounts in order to buy that stock. Now, what's buying on margin? Buying on margin is described here in the Investopedia is buying an asset by borrowing the balance from whoever it is that you're otherwise helping broker it. They say a bank or a broker. Buying on margin refers to the initial payment made to the broker for the asset, for example, 10% down, 90% finance, or in the case of Robinhood, probably 100% finance for people that just signed up. Said in the shortest form that I can imagine, it means that when you wanted to buy $100 of GameStop stock, Robinhood instead used its own money to buy it for you, gave you the GameStop stock, and then the collateral for that quote unquote loan was the GameStop stock itself. Now that works perfectly well if the value of the GameStop stock isn't wildly swinging around within a three-day period or whatever time period it might take for your deposit to clear. If it is wildly swinging around, then you can imagine that if they buy a $350 share of stock 
they float you $350 and it's worth $25 tomorrow, then the exposure on Robinhood is significant. So you've got this volatility. You've got this situation in the stock market, their own exposure risks, the SEC capital rules, all this stuff comes in to say, whoa, we got to slow this down. And why do I say that this was on margin? One of the things you might've seen yesterday is if you were looking at these kinds of accounts that a number of people that were looking into this said that some of the people were on margin calls, but a lot of people said they weren't on margin calls. And I said, that is really weird because this strikes me as something that they would do if they had the right under a margin call. In fact, if we go and we look at the customer agreement, we go all the way back up to number one here, I believe it is number one F we see once again that Robinhood may at any time in its sole discretion and without prior notice prohibit or restrict my ability to trade securities, but also that Robinhood reserves the right to require full payment in cleared funds prior to the acceptance of any order. We don't have to float money for you. In the event that I fail to provide sufficient funds, Robinhood may, at its option and without notice to me, charge a reasonable rate of interest, liquidate the property subject to the buy order, or sell other property owned by me and held in any of my accounts. So what I think was happening was if you go and you look at how Robinhood actually works, they have this thing called Robinhood Instant. It's effectively that you sign up with Robinhood. You tell them that you're going to put a certain amount of money into Robinhood. That's fine. But the way the clearing of checks works, the way the clearing of transfers works into Robinhood is that it will generally take a small period of time two days, three days, five days, whatever it might be. Robinhood doesn't want you to have to wait because you're trying to get in on a hot market. And so they say bank transfers up to $1,000 into Robinhood are instantly available for investing. Now, if you've ever cashed a check in your bank account, you know that it tells you it's not instantly available. The bank actually has to go through a little bit of work to make sure that that money changes over into accounts and gives it to you. Robinhood says no. For at least $1,000, when you sign up with us, you can just buy something. So as best I can tell, and somebody can easily come into the comments and correct me on this, people that signed up, especially this week, and wanted to get into GameStop, maybe buy $1,000, maybe buy more, because Robinhood also has a kind of gold notion that if you've told it you're going to have enough money in there, it could potentially make this instant deposit concept bigger. I don't know exactly how that works. Again, I'm not a Robinhood customer. You can, again, educate me in the comments to this video, but that Robinhood is floating money that you might not realize that you are quote unquote on margin. But if you signed up this week and your money hasn't cleared from the bank, then that's an exposure item for Robinhood. And they probably have some margin language somewhere in the small type, somewhere on their application or their website to tell you that this is in fact the case. I don't know how instant deposits would otherwise work if it's not Robinhood floating the money, which means that for all the financial calculations and the asset classes and everything else that is going on under the hood, as their blog is entitled, I believe, or they didn't have it titled that in 2016, that for all of that, when you have this massive sense of volatility, Robinhood has to look at its situation, look at its compliance obligations, look at its capital and its clearinghouse rules and say, oh my goodness, this is way too much risk. And once they do that, then you get actions like happened yesterday. Then you get those restrictions, not just at Robinhood, but at other internet facing sites that say, oh my goodness, if I'm trying to facilitate this day and date trading, if I'm really on margin, but not really describing it as such, then I need to be able to take these steps. And one of the reasons you might have seen steps like this taken yesterday is in order to try to get their house right, in order to allow trading of some kind that they would do today. Now, if you're also interested in on margin trading, just in general, I can also recommend, of course, Saved by the Bell season one, episode three, Wall Street in which Zach Morris, the unfairly impugned by Funny or Die and Zach Morris's trash, decided to buy potatoes on margin, ultimately winding up in the loss of his teacher's car. You can read this blog post, which is very fulsome. I think it's thousands and thousands of words on this single episode, or you can check out the episode wherever Saved by the Bell may be found. Now, the last thing I wanted to cover on this video is, of course, the big elephant in the room. This has been brought up by a number of folks in the comments. One of the things that was implied, if not outright stated, in the lawsuit that we looked at the top of this video is this notion that more was going on behind the scenes. Hap tip to Kona Gaming, at Kona Panchu uh, on Twitter. I've seen this tweet and was wondering if this changes anything from your video about can Robin Hood do this? And says, thanks, bro. I'm a big fan of your channel. Obviously, you're going to get more hat tips if you say you're a big fan of the channel. I'm just kidding. And I am apologize. I can't zoom this in a little bit closer. This is from uh, Paul Gosser, member of Congress. I am greatly troubled with the events that have unfolded on Wall Street and demand action from the U.S. Department of Justice 
Today, a FINRA-regulated broker-dealer called Robinhood halted the purchase of stocks for several publicly traded companies, including GameStop, BlackBerry, AMC, and others. This unilateral move was done in a concerted effort to deplatform and silence individual investors. Okay, so somebody copy and pasted their section CDA 230 talking about Facebook locking off conservatives or whatever it might be and applied it to this particular situation. They weren't really trying to silence anybody. The better claim here, if any, is that they were trying to advantage people that had an ownership interest in them. This began when an investment management fund called Melvin Capital Management placed an aggressive short sell on the company GameStop. To contradict this decision, the heavily followed Reddit page r slash Wall Street Bets. But you never thought you'd see that particular name in a letter from a Congress, uh, uh, congressional representative. And their administrators advocated that their followers purchase GameStop stock using the broker Robinhood. The movement was so immense that it drove the stock price to over 400% of its previous value. I, here's where I say that I think the Wall Street Bets component, while they led this thing, the volume couldn't have possibly just come from them. There's more than retail investors invested in all of this stuff, but that's for another video. As a result, Melvin Capital lost billions on their return, and Robinhood blocked users from buying any more of GameStop stock, but still allowed liquidation. Now, here I want to take a pause, and I, I mentioned this to a couple of people that talked to me on social media yesterday. The alternative to this, people said, hey, they should have just blocked it entirely, in many ways looks significantly worse. If Robinhood blocks both purchases and closing a position, getting rid of your interest in the stock. It looks a whole lot more, especially to new investors or investors that haven't dealt with applications of this type a lot, that Robinhood has seized your money, has allowed you to buy this stock, and then won't let you alter your stars depending on whether GameStop goes up or down. If that is in fact the case, I'd argue that they would have put themselves in a worse position for lawsuits and regulatory compliance and all these things because it looked like you actually seized the assets. So by just allowing it to remain open on liquidation, it says, hey, look, you can still ride this up uh, and you can liquidate if you so choose, but we're not locking this money in. We haven't claimed it when we don't have a right to do so. Continuing with the congressional letter, Melvin Capital Management is owned by the parent company Citadel LLC, which according to a Bloomberg report, gave Robinhood roughly 40% of their revenue. And that would need to be clarified in any kind of investigation. Knowing the involvement Citadel has with Robinhood, it is clear, always look out when Congress says it is clear, that the actions taken today were motivated by anti-competitive reasons, not for concerns of volatility claimed by Robinhood. Of course, the easy answer to that is, okay, then does everybody else that acted on this same volatility also have such an interest? And if not, how do you distinguish Robinhood from those actors? Because of this blatant conflict of interest and obvious monopolistic activity, now nobody accuses Robinhood of having a monopoly in anything, so that's in and of itself a bridge one step too far. I am calling on an immediate investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice into Robinhood and the hedge fund of Citadel LLC. Now, you've heard me kind of say that this is all in the shadows and we can't actually claim these things because it's all effectively rumors and innuendo and conspiracies. And I still think that it is as of today, but you might be surprised for me to say, I got no problem with an investigation. In fact, I think an investigation is probably called for with respect to ownership groups like this. Now, I will also say that if this was allowed before now, chances are, and I haven't looked into the structures here, that in some fashion it was legal. That having this relationship between the parent company and the hedge fund and the uh, application that helps broker retail investors and all these things didn't violate specific regulations as of the date that they happen. But it's also worth noting that the people that come into my comments that are on the Reddit subreddit saying, hey, this is ridiculous, that are complaining about Wall Street fat cats because of the optics here are right. The optics here, to the extent all of this is true, and I can't claim that I know whether Citadel gave 40% of their revenue to Robin Hood. If it is true, if these relationships exist, they look terrible. And just like other market manipulations, they lower faith in the market regardless of whether anything went wrong or not. So like other rules and regulations that focus on the implication of something being bad, this is worthwhile of an investigation, even if they find nothing. And to potentially look at rules and regulations that have this ownership concept separated more, right? 
Because I can sit here in a video in virtual legality and tell you, look, the volatility was this. You're going to buy things on margin. They're trying to facilitate margin buying. Once that happens, you've got all this exposure risk. They're going to have to get out of that liability and exposure somehow. And the SEC is actually going to mandate that they do so in certain capacities. I'm going to tell you that that's a decent reason for Robinhood to have acted in that way. But also you're going to come back at me and say, but all this stuff about ownership. And I'm going to say, you're right. It looks bad. And it looks like there's a possibility for malfeasance. And if there is a possibility for malfeasance in the marketplace, then you can assume that faith is lowered by people that are going to finish this whole process out whenever that might happen and say the fix was in and I'm not putting my investment in the capital markets anymore. And Wall Street is just down to kill the little guys, whether or not it did happen in this particular instance. So I think an investigation is entirely warranted. You want to clear these things up, find out if something did happen. And the one thing I will tell people that commented in my earlier video that I said they have the right to do this under the contract, so it's a very difficult claim against them to make, is that if you do find a smoking gun, an email saying, oh, we're going to do this and twirling their mustaches with glee and smoking the cigars in some darkly lit room, then yeah, you can bring a fraud complaint. You can bring a restraint of trade complaint. You can bring a fiduciary duty breach complaint. You can do all those things. But as it stands right now, you're going to need a little bit more. And no, the discovery process in the state of New York, in the federal courts, is not really designed for, I think they might have done something together. Let me go through their emails, which is what the earlier lawsuit amounts to. So I'm with everybody that says this looks bad and even that it stinks to high heaven because if this ownership connection does exist, it does in fact stink to high heaven. But it's important to note that you didn't actually need to commit financial fraud to take the actions that were taken yesterday. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you like this, please check out the ways to support the channel. I love doing this, uh, but obviously as it's gotten bigger, it has taken more and more of my time. And I appreciate every single one of you that support it through the Patreon, through tips at Streamlabs, just from buying a Reasonable Minds Can Differ shirt. All of that is great. But if at the end of the day, you don't want to put any money into this, I totally understand that. If you just subscribe, ring bells, tell your friends, tell folks that we're having conversations about the business and law of technology, video games, music, movies, television, and the news stories that you're otherwise reading. That, that is just as appreciated in supporting this channel, virtual legality, and helping to make us grow. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Thank you.